Hello, and welcome to this edition of Safe and Secure. We have an exciting show for you today. Today, we meet Inspector John Martin. We caught up with him at a local elementary school where he was speaking on career day. Police and fire departments across the country are being confronted more and more with gun violence in the workplace and public areas like malls, schools, and Southfield first responders are training for such a possibility. And opioid-related deaths continue to rise in the United States, and we visit the Salvation Army Rehabilitation Center in Detroit where folks can find treatment and support. We'll have this and more today on Safe and Secure. According to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, opioids kill more than 42,000 people in 2016, with 40% of all overdoses involving prescription opioids. In Oakland County, 165 people died from opiate-related deaths in 2016 alone. Every day in America, over 6,500 people are hospitalized for substance abuse. That's 65 hundred families with moms, dads, and kids disrupted by the effects of addiction. Costs related to the abuse of tobacco, alcohol, and illegal drugs total over 700 billion annually. 700 billion is enough to pay every nurse's salary in America for the next nine years. The Salvation Army has more non-fee residential treatment facilities than any rehab program in America. Sergeant Jarrett Lanzon tells us more. For over 100 years, the Salvation Army's adult rehabilitation centers and Harbor Lights programs have offered spiritual, emotional, and social assistance to those who have lost the ability to cope with their problems and provide for themselves. Lynn, thanks for being with us today. I have a few questions for you. Sure. What is the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Center? We are an adult rehabilitation center that focuses on men and women with the disease of addiction. That can include alcohol, drugs, sometimes homelessness, and any other areas that men and women are struggling with. We have two campuses, one in Romulus for women with 91 beds, and one in Detroit down on West Fort Street with 313 beds. Our program is a six-month program, but men and women can stay for a total of one year from start to finish. Um, our program includes a variety of topics such as anger management, domestic violence intervention, addiction education, relapse prevention, and of course Christian living and Bible study as we are a faith-based organization. Is there a medical component to the program? There is not. We are an, a rehabilitation center. We are not a treatment center, meaning that we are not medical or clinical in any way, shape, or form. So we service a population that is able to conduct themselves and rehabilitate themselves through work therapy, through counseling, and through the classes that we provide. Lynn, what can you generalize about folks that have been through the program? So we see men and women severely addicted on a regular basis. We do not provide detox services, but we do work with a variety of agencies throughout the metropolitan Detroit area to get detox to the men and women who come through our doors. We will transport them to the detox facility and we will pick them up from the detox facility once they are completed with their detox and bring them back to the Adult Rehabilitation Center to begin their program with us. Can you talk about some of the common conditions you see when people join the program, such as health issues, homelessness, poverty, or illnesses? Nobody comes to us because their lives are in stellar order. Obviously, we, we see the human condition in its most uh, basic, uh, desperate form. So we, of course, see poverty. People come to us with nothing but the clothes on their back. And that's okay, because we, 
We do service them in terms of helping them to build a foundation, to get clean, to get sober, and to get their lives back in order. We see um, HIV positive, we see hepatitis C. We have a number of medical conditions um, that come through our doors. Most of them we are able to assist them with getting the help they need, either through hospitals or um, in the case of mental health through a variety of mental health clinics that we work with um, around both of the campuses. Lynn, there's been a lot of talk about the opioid epidemic over the last couple of years. Do you see the effects of opioid addiction? If so, how does it manifest and what demographics are you dealing with? The demographic has changed. It's a lot younger. We see a lot of uh, men and women barely out of high school, still 18, 19 years old. It must be 18 for our program, but the population has gotten younger. Our demographic ranges from very young to very old. Um, we have, most recently, we had a man in our program who was 77, and we also have 18 year olds in our program. So we see drug addiction manifesting itself um, without, a, without being a respecter of age, gender, race. It spans all of them. I'm sure you want to see people from every different walk of life feel comfortable when they enter your program. Do you see members from the LGBTQ community? And if so, are there any type of special concerns that you have? Our mission statement says that we will meet human need without discrimination. So we definitely do not discriminate in terms of who or what type of addict will come through our doors. I don't think in terms of their addiction that uh, men and women from the LGBTQ community come in with, with special needs. I do think that they come in with um, maybe a little bit more concerns in the area of mental health, only because because of the the uh, social stigma that they face um, while out in the out in the streets. What are the intake guidelines for somebody under the influence that's having a moment of clarity and wishing to seek treatment? So we welcome um, any and all who make that decision um, in a moment of clarity to come in and seek help. It's a really small window of time, so we try to capture that when somebody believes they're ready. Not everybody comes through clean and sober and ready to be intaked. So in the case where we can identify that somebody is either not sober or under the influence in any way, we would segregate them from our current uh, population and either wait until they become sober or help them get to a detox facility. In either case, we most likely would help them get to a detox facility. Um, but we're not able to put them in our population until they are not under the influence. Is this a voluntary program or are people mandated by the court? It's both, really. We will take those who want to come in on their own, and then we also work with MDOC. We work with the court systems in, um, in the counties surrounding Detroit, as well as out of state sometimes, to accept men and women who are stipulated or court ordered to complete a program. Folks without any health insurance or without any money may be concerned that they don't have the means to enter your program. Is this the case? And if not, how is the program funded? So the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Center is fully funded by the 37 thrift stores around the metro Detroit area. So when somebody donates to one of the thrift stores or when they shop at one of the thrift stores, they're actually funding our program. We, had, we don't accept insurance, we don't bill insurances, and a person does not have to have insurance or money to come through our doors. Lynn, you mentioned that there are 37 stores within the Metro Detroit area. Can you talk a little bit about the work therapy program? That's really one of the unique components of the Adult Rehabilitation Center program. That being that we have a work therapy component to our program. So everybody that comes through has to be able to work 40 hours a week. That work can include work in the, in the thrift stores. It can be work on a front desk in one of our facilities. It can be in the kitchen of one of our facilities, janitorial. 
they really have a chance to develop a variety of skills. With this component, they are actually able to build their foundation in terms of the things that they learn how to do, especially in retail. So the majority of our men and women do work in the stores just because we have so many of them. And we actually hire approximately 80% of the men and women who complete our programs and are looking to be hired. What considerations are made for people with families and small children wishing to enter the program? We believe strongly in the, the support of family and a strong support system and therefore we do um, advocate for visits quickly in the in the program so right when they come in they're able to invite their families to chapel services on sunday both the men and women we provide a sunday school service for the children of the men and women and at our women's campus we have even installed a, a wonderful playground so that they can sp spend time outside with their families with their children in addition we work with child protective services to schedule supervised visits when necessary so yeah, we think that's really important, restoring families. What happens when people get near the end of the program? When men and women start to approach the end of the six months, um, they know they're nearing their completion and they don't feel ready to re-enter society. We do allow men and women to stay up to a year. At the time of their completion from the six month program, they would go into a new level, which would allow them to begin work on a career portfolio, putting together a resume, looking at job readiness, addressing issues that might be a barrier to them being able to re-enter society. And we would begin to work on those more independent of the first six month program. Um, at the time they become hired as an employee, uh, then we start to transition them into independent housing. So we would begin to work with outside entities to see if we might be able to get them into some independent housing. Police are often tasked with solving a lot of social problems within society. We'd like to use the Salvation Army as a resource for us, for folks out there wishing to seek treatment. If we run into somebody in the course of our duties that wishes to seek treatment but can't get a ride downtown to your center, are they welcome to come down to the police department and can a ride be arranged from there? Yes, yes, we transport from the police stations, from the courts, from the jails. So if you can get them here, we will come and get them. The only time where we might not be able to is if they are too heavily intoxicated and we would just ask to wait until they, you know, calm down a little bit. Okay. Um, I do want to say that we have several beds available in both campuses. It is our goal to partner with Southfield Police Department as well as other uh, courts and district courts, circuit courts, to be able to fill those beds with people who have the desire to stay clean and to help them achieve that success. Incarceration isn't always the answer, especially when the police are dealing with somebody with a drug or alcohol addiction problem. When dealing with drug or alcohol addiction, it's better to get the root of the problem. So we would much rather see somebody seek treatment than to place them in a jail cell. If somebody wants to find out more about the Salvation Army Rehabilitation Program, what can they do? So if you are interested in coming to the program, please contact us at area code 313-965-7760, extension 234. That's 313-965-7760, extension 234. We will take somebody in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Lynn, thanks for your time today, and it's good to know that you're a resource for the community. The job of a police officer or firefighter is not for everyone. But for those who are really interested, it could offer a great career path. John Martin has been a firefighter for over 20 years and he was recently promoted to fire investigation and fire prevention. We caught up with John recently at Southfield's 60th anniversary celebration. Okay, so we're here for a public event that the city has thrown for the residents. And as you can see behind me, we have our smoke trailer. This trailer was bought with uh, drug forfeiture money through the police department. And we take this to schools and events like this 
to teach kids and adults about how to get out of a house if it was on fire with the smoke. Part of John's job allows him to go to various schools and speak to public groups about the fire department and fire prevention. We only reach a low percentage of our residents here in Southfield when we go on emergency runs. So for us to be able to talk to the public, get to introduce ourselves, tell them about what the fire department does, um, we get a great, great feedback from our citizens. It's important with fire prevention that we, when we're reaching out at target groups, that we don't want to overwhelm them with uh, technical words or language. Um, so the little kids, being that their attention span is not the same as a teenager, we have to keep our message short and sweet. And then as the kids get older, we, talk, we can talk to them about more important things. So. It's not only the kids who benefit from the community outreach. Um, I think the teachers really appreciate that we take the time and that we're being proactive to reach out to the community. For the most part is letting them know what a firefighter does um, as far as responding to fires, uh, maybe some of the things that I've seen over my career, um, and then also, you know, the importance of smoke detectors. You know, I started this career with Southfield 20 years ago. Um, it's, it's been a great, a great ride. Um, I've seen a lot of terrible things, but I've also seen a lot of amazing things. Both the Southfield Fire and Police Departments have a Speakers Bureau. To contact them about someone coming to speak with your homeowners association, you can call the non-emergency lines at the respective departments. Active shooter is a phrase we have heard all too often on the national news. National tragedies remind us that the risk is real. First responders everywhere are taking steps now to prepare so they can react quickly when every second counts. Recently, eight city fire and police departments came together at Lamphere High School to practice life safety techniques as part of the Oakway organization. So what this opportunity provides us is the chance to actually have our fire crews work with the police, various police crews that are on scene um, to help simulate our response to an active assailant type incident. It gives us a chance to move around the building and actually practice some of our tactics and our response to this, you know, hopefully never, but if it ever occurs. So we are practicing an all-out scenario here with our incident command structure, which would involve more than just responding and running into a building. We have various staff positions that we utilize, um, staging, making sure that we're accountable for all the crews that are on scene, notifying hospitals and other agencies of possible assistance that we might require from them. So it really gives us a full-scale chance to practice what could potentially occur during a real scenario. Obviously what we see a lot in the news is all these active assailant incidents that are happening. Um, so the value is that we're preparing like we do for a fire, for a medical call, um, for any situation. But we're getting multiple agencies together between law enforcement and fire departments to operate smoothly together on a big disaster like this. Uh, actually, uh, we have eight agencies here that cover, uh, I think, 14 communities um, for fire departments. And there's uh, multiple police departments uh, that also came to help us out and train with us and we all can what we agree on is that we all kind of train together so it's part of our mutual aid group that we've worked together and this is a great mutual aid group because we do a lot of training together to have standard uh, operations and uh, standard of patient care to, to take care of and avoid. To add some realism to the day's activities, students from the Lanfear High School's drama department participated as victims. Uh, I was approached in September by the Mass Lights Fire Department if they could do a training drill at our building and we readily accepted and I am here today as the, just looking over the building and they asked for volunteers and when they asked for volunteers and our drama department volunteered to be the, the victims in today's uh, training and they came out to their kids volunteered and they're taking part in the training for the police. We're just honored that we were asked to be able to take part in this. It's a really important thing 
for all of Oakland County in today's culture. We need to make sure we're prepared in case an incident happens in Oakland County. Uh, the skills we're working on are uh, working with our police department in what we call a unified command, also working in what we call a rescue task force scenario where we work with police and fire to rescue victims. Um, they're working on their paramedic skills, which they get a lot of practice, so it's not a whole lot of work. They're also radio communications and dealing with large incidents and many uh, responders coming and organizing them into the incident command system. So traditionally what happens is, is we'd receive a 911 call, whether it's from a staff member or a student, somebody in the building that notices that there is an active shooter or active assailant within the building. They notify their local 911 center, at which point that starts the ball rolling. You start getting local response from your police and fire departments, EMS agencies. And once we start to ascertain how large scale the incident would be, we make a request of Oakland County. They start deploying other resources throughout the county, other fire departments, police agencies, state police, sheriffs, all the, all the types of agencies that might be able to better assist us, as well as notifying area hospitals that they're about to, you know, to prepare for a surge of patients and victims. Uh, we, we do have unique responsibility and roles, but what, what's great about it is we all understand each other's responsibility and roles so that we can work together in a smooth transition so everybody has their responsibility and roles covered and we have, could deliver the base, best care we can to other citizens that we protect. Sir. So the, the value of this for our crews is we're actually participating with our Oakway Mutual Aid Group. It's eight area fire departments that we come together and help each other all the time on fire and emergency scenes. Uh, so these are the same crews that we would actually be responding to if this were to ever occur in Southfield. We would be calling them for assistance. So it's important for us to be able to train and that's part of the value of an exercise like this is we get to actually train side by side with some of the agencies we would be relying on if this were to ever occur. Uh, pretty much, it's just been uh, learning about uh, active assailant training for uh, shootings in schools or in, uh, for mass shootings. So it's just learning how to get patients out, learning how to go in with PD and work, work together with PD and get patients out to get them treated and transported to the hospital and uh, save as many lives as we can. Pretty fortunate in Southfield where we have not had this type of incident on a regular basis. Uh, we do train for it on a regular basis though, but anyone who watches the news sees that these types of things happen all the time, unfortunately. So it's better for us to be prepared for when it happens as opposed to being caught and not prepared. Every training is a valuable training. This is kind of unfortunate that we have to train for something like this, but it, it's good for us to be prepared and have a plan in place should this ever occur. A free safety seminar aimed at teenage girls and their parents was recently held by the Southfield Police Department at the Southfield Public Library. It was well attended and two of Southfield's finest led the seminar, officers Kelly Pate and Kelly Buckberry. What's happening tonight? Tonight is our third annual teen safety seminar where we're having uh, teen girls come out and we're basically letting them know different safety things that they can do, things that they, are, that they can be aware of so they don't become a victim of a crime. With everything going on with social media and just in the news today, we just want to make our teen girls just aware of things that, to keep them from becoming a victim as far as going somewhere with strangers, talking to strangers on the internet, just things that they can do to make themselves aware so they don't become a victim of a crime. Well, social media, sometimes they're not really aware of who they're speaking to on social media. They might think they're speaking to somebody that's their age, but it could actually be somebody else. The police presentation provided information on personal safety and awareness, self-defense strategies and techniques, internet safety tips, and how to avoid becoming a victim of a crime, and what to do if you are a victim of a crime. Basically be aware of your surroundings, when you're out and about, when you're with your friends, when you're walking to and from your car. Take a look around, make sure nobody's following you and just be aware of what's going on. Don't be walking and looking at your phone and not paying attention to your surroundings. The message for parents is to be involved with your kids. Be aware of who they're hanging out and talking with and who your kids' friends are.
Well, what parents can basically do is just be aware of who your kid's hanging out with, who your kid's friends are, who they're talking to on social media. Take a look at their phone and their laptop and see whether or not it's someone you want them to be talking to. It's very difficult for parents to, to be aware of absolutely everything their kids are doing online. But two, talk to your kids. Ask your kids what they're, what they're doing. Get to know their friends and their friends' parents and where their, your kids are going. Make sure you're verifying where your kids say that they are at. We're going to talk about uh, how you can make noise and draw attention to yourself. Uh, we're actually going to be providing all the girls with whistles tonight and, and we're going to just basically show them a couple different techniques that are very simple. Not something that they could hold somebody down for a 10 count, but just that they can get away from somebody and get to safety. There's definitely different self-defense courses that you can take. Tonight we're going to be illustrating a couple different simple self-defense uh, moves that the girls can do. Just simple things so it can make them get away from someone. All of our new electronic devices are cool and helpful, but they can really be distracting to what is going on around us. Well, I would definitely say the texting, that texting and not paying attention to their surroundings. I see that so often, and not just teenage girls. I see adults doing that also, just texting and looking down at their phone or using their electronics and not paying attention to what's going on around them. This is a little bit different than what the schools are dealing with. This is really geared towards what the girls can do when they're out and about, when they're with their friends. We're going to talk a little bit about if you're going to parties, what to be aware of, and also to prepare some of the, the girls are going off to college too. And just to teach them that unfortunately bad things can happen to good people and we just don't want any of our girls to become victims of a crime. You can find different self-defense courses online. Often karate studios will offer these type of classes you should consider taking some type of personal safety defense course and be sure to watch notices around Southfield for other classes. Well, that's it for this edition of Safe and Secure. To find out more about the Southfield Police and Fire Departments, go to cityofsouthfield.com. You can also find out more by going to our Facebook and YouTube channel and looking at our respective pages. Until next time, stay safe and secure.